Hello everybody, my name is Gaming and welcome to Genshin Impact, an indie gacha game that you guys have been suggesting en masse. Before we get into another epic all ages audiovisual adventure, I'd like to tell you all to smash that like button, hit the bell and disconnect your carbon monoxide detector. It costs you nothing and you would make me really sad if you didn't. Ignore the Minecraft gameplay, that's just there so the younger audience stays on this video for longer. In today's video, we're going to be talking about the flaws of Genshin Impact's enemy design and how they negatively affect the gaming experience. My criticisms will be as objective and unbiased as possible, except when they aren't. Chapter 1. The Two Kinds of Genshin Impact Enemies Genshin Impact's enemies can be separated into two categories. Combo food and not fun. Combo food enemies are designed to die in large quantities in an attempt to make you feel like an overpowered anime character. It really doesn't matter how under level you are, the only way these guys are going to put up a fight is if the game spawns in seven of them at once. These enemies are actually kind of fun to fight from time to time, though the lack of challenge and the absence of punchy combat music makes it difficult to enjoy doing this for more than 30 minutes. This is where the not fun category comes in. These enemies are more often than not special enemies or bosses and are defined by an overabundance of janky super armor, total hyper armor, elemental shields you just so happen to lack the tools to break, and complete immunities to the elements half your party just so happens to use. And you obviously can't change your party while in combat because this is a finished and polished game. Lock and key design is not a new thing, and it's also not inherently bad. But when three out of four bosses in the chapter that repeatedly tells you to always bring an electro character have an electro immunity the game doesn't warn you about before locking your party, there might be a problem. Usually, these enemies also have massive health bars, are only vulnerable for a small amount of time, and need I remind you, they still have hyper armor through all of this. I know the game wants to make the bosses feel like overpowered anime villains, but when you do this by just upsizing their stats and hitboxes instead of giving them more interesting movesets, the experience becomes less like an intense duel between two overpowered combatants and more akin to trying to shoo Isaac Clarke with a can of that dollar store pepper spray. Chapter 2. Why is the game like this? Short answer. The game is designed for administering periodical dopamine hits to give the player artificial motivation to upgrade their characters and gamble for new ones. The game is frustrating, but what if you were just able to get one of those super strong 5 stars to make it a little bit easier? Sure, you could also just play a different game, but oh, look, look guys, look, the animation is yellow this time. Now, these tricks don't work on a hardcore gamer as desensitized to dopamine as myself, but the younger audience this game targets will absolutely eat this up. The sparkly particle effects, the huge bursts of damage dealt by elemental reactions, the hundreds of treasure chests with barely anything in them, the constant drip feeding of teeny tiny increments of primo gems, the pity system increasing the likelihood of you getting something rare if you gamble often, the constant flow of time limited events. All of these things are designed to give the player a gambling addiction. And like with all gambling, the house always wins. Genshin Impact lives and will die by the success of Baby's First Casino. Any aspect of this game being incredibly mid isn't a problem. If it were, the game wouldn't be making so much money. Chapter 3. Breaking the game out of spite. I could sit here for 20 minutes and tell you all about how mid and stinky this game is, but I'm not gonna do that. Instead, I'm going to tell you what the quickest, cheapest, fastest, and most efficient ways to completely and utterly ruin this game's difficulty. The first thing you'll want to do is talk to a statue, then feed it eyes until it gives you a potion that lets you buy this. Congratulations, you now have the best single target battery zero dollars can buy you. To oversimplify, your elemental skill generates up to three crack rocks. Anyone who eats one gets four energy and a 32.5% boost to their energy gain for six seconds. As long as you give at least one rock to someone other than Electrav here, the cooldown of this ability is 12 seconds. Basically, if you want one dude in particular to always have enough for his burst, this fellow will get you there. And for me, that dude is... Bennett is commonly misunderstood to be a support, battery, or healer when in actuality, he is all of them, and one of the best in his class at each. His burst creates the Wind Field, which I call that because if you stand in it, you win! This burst is easiest to explain as having two phases. 
In Phase 1, you have total invincibility, which lasts until the ground slam animation ends and a huge pyro explosion is created. Phase 2 is what I call the area of effect this explosion leaves behind. First off, this AoE afflicts you with pyro, meaning you essentially take 50 to 100% more damage from both sources. But that's fine, as it also heals you periodically if your active character's health falls to or below 70%. And make no mistake, you are out-healing the damage you take. It also increases the active member's attack power, and reduces Bennett's elemental skill cooldown to 2 seconds, meaning you can jab something with pyro damage and generate free elemental particles every 2 seconds. Combine this with the previously mentioned energy gain buff from Electrav, and 90% wind field uptime becomes a lifestyle. Congratulations, nothing in this game could threaten you anymore because you will heal it all back anyway. You can now muck about in boss fights as much as you like, long as you pass Benny as crack from time to time. Sure, your damage output may suffer slightly, but that's a small price to pay for the joy of seeing any boss charge up their big super move, and gaily continuing to hammer in on them because you're immortal anyway. Alternatively, if you don't have Bennett, you could spin the Beginner's Wish 8 times and get a viable substitute guaranteed. The Well is a tank healer hybrid who trades shield uptime for shield durability, the ability to heal, and an automated safety net in the form of devotion. This goofy-looking metal corset fails to properly protect approximately 40% of Noelle's organs. So to make up for this, she gets access to the SHIELD. The SHIELD makes you impervious to direct damage, though status effects like freeze and corrosion can still pass through. Attacking an enemy as the well while her SHIELD is active will slightly decrease its cooldown, as well as having a 50% chance to heal all party members for a small amount of health. This element of RNG and the requirement of hitting enemies to heal makes Noelle's healing output less consistent than Bennett's, though this is largely made up for by how much less damage you're taking while she's on your team. Noelle's burst, Big Sword, also infuses her weapon with Geo and greatly extends her hitboxes for a sizable amount of time, allowing you to rely on crystallized shields whenever you need additional protection. Well, that's all I have to say for today. Merry April's Fools, everyone! Don't spread too much misinformation on the internet, don't consume too much either, and don't take gotcha too seriously, cause I sure don't either. I'm going to close the video now because this is starting to hurt my throat. Actually, before I go, a couple of words to the devs. Please add a gay character because this game has none, please give Traveler a gun in the next update, and please give Traveler a companion that doesn't make me want to beat the daylight out of them!